Hello and welcome to the Digital Diabetes Index launch webinar. The index has been created by the Economist Intelligence Unit and was sponsored by MedTech Europe. My name is Ellie Vaughan and I am an associate in the health policy team at the Economist Intelligence Unit and I have been responsible for the creation and development of the Digital Diabetes Index. Today's webinar, I'll be taking you through an introduction to the Digital Diabetes Index, so covering the methodology and the key findings from the index. Before I hand over to my colleague, Liz Sucker, who will be taking you through a panel discussion with three experts in diabetes across Europe. And then we will have a word from our sponsor, MedTech Europe, before we close the webinar for today. So to start with introducing the Digital Diabetes Index, where we want to start is the rationale behind putting together this piece of work. So within Europe, there's a large number of people with diabetes and a high cost of care for people with diabetes. And both of these figures are set to rise over the coming years. And a lot of the costs of diabetes care are due to complications and comorbidities, a lot of which can be either prevented or reduced through the optimal care of people with diabetes. And all of these factors combine to create an impetus for action to find a solution to this. Research indicates that digital tools and services can offer benefits to people with diabetes and the health systems that support them through improved care and better outcomes. So for us, this then begs the question, of whether health systems are leveraging the opportunities that, that digital health offers to enhance diabetes care. And to help to answer this question, the Digital Diabetes Index benchmarks the readiness of 10 European countries to deploy digital interventions with a focus on digital technologies that are used to care for and treat people with type one and type two diabetes. The methodology that we use for the index is a very standard methodology that we use across indexes. And we began with a rapid literature review, and this is designed to identify themes that then go into a draft index framework. And the index framework is made up of domains, so broad topic areas, and then has indicators within those domains. And the indicators are essentially questions, the answer to which we then translate into a numerical score. We then convened an advisory board who provided input into the index framework and the development of the index more broadly. And the information from the literature review and the advisory board were then combined to refine this index framework and create a finalized index. The index itself includes 10 European countries, which are Bel Belgium, Denmark, England, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Slovenia and Spain. The index framework is made up of three domains and on the left hand side of your screen you can see that these are conceptualized as three concentric circles and this is to reflect the fact that these different domains are building upon each other and are interrelated. So the first of our domains is the readiness for digital healthcare and this focuses on broad digital health infrastructure such as electronic health records and telemonitoring. And this makes up 10% of the overall score. And the reason for this was that, although it is a very fundamental part of the digital health infrastructure upon which digital diabetes care is built, it was not the focus for this study. We wanted to focus more on diabetes specific digital infrastructure. And also the overall digital health infrastructure is um, there are some people reporting that they can't see the slides. Please bear with me one moment and I will just reshare my screen for you. My apologies that you couldn't see the slides there. Thank you for alerting me to that. So the three 
concentric rings of the index are shown here. So you should be able to see my slides now and apologies for that. And the readiness for digital diabetes care, that's our second ring of our um, domains there. And this is really focusing on the digital diabetes infrastructure, such as the coverage of digital diabetes in diabetes policy. And this was far more central to our research question. And as such, this was, makes up 50% of the final score for the overall um, score on the index. And then the final ring of the diagram there, the final domain, is the digital diabetes care incentives and payments. And this focuses on digital diabetes tool funding and whether incentives are in place to encourage their use by healthcare professionals and people with diabetes. And this made up 40% of the overall score. And this was because we found that these types of incentives, which are not just financial, but also include things like recommendations within clinical guidelines and support for patients and education in using them. And we found that these were really key tools for enabling access to these different tools in practice. So we felt that it was important that their, their um, role in access was reflected in the amount of the score that they made up, hence it's 40%. And the data collection process that we used for populating the index was a combination of desk research and interviews to answer the various questions or indicators. And this gives us a final score out of 100 for each domain and then for the overall indicators, uh, the combined domains for the index score. And you can see here that we have used high, medium and low clustering scores. And on the right hand side, you can see that this enables a really quick side by side comparison between countries. So you can see here the overall score, the digital readiness, the digital diabetes readiness and the digital diabetes incentives and payments. And you can see where countries are doing well, where there's room for improvement, and you can get a really good idea of the overall view of the index from this single graphic. And the key findings from the index are that overall digital health infrastructure is in place. And we found that scores were very tightly clustered in domain one for so that digital readiness. And that was something that did, did surprise us, um, that all of these countries were within around 13 points of each other out of 100. These were very, very similar in this domain. And where the variability really emerged was in these domains two and three. And here scores were much more widely distributed. And that to us indicated that this is where the most action is needed in terms of policy and also practice. We found that reimbursement was the most commonly used incentive for digital diabetes tool use, and that was for both healthcare professionals and people with diabetes. We also looked for whether there was evidence of alternative funding models, like those used in pharmaceuticals, that would facilitate access to innovative digital diabetes tools not covered by traditional reimbursement. And we found that this was not the case in any of the countries that we looked at. Again, this is a, a gap where there may be an opportunity for um, different practice to take place. The key conclusions of the Digital Diabetes Index, we have translated into these future directions for digital diabetes. And we've conceptualized these, as you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, as five different enablers of access to digital diabetes tools. And the arrow on the left hand side in the purple indicates that all of these enablers are leading towards the common goal of improving outcomes for people with diabetes. So to go into these in a little bit more detail, obviously we have the improving outcomes as the ultimate goal that we're all working towards. And the first future direction we've identified is around reimbursement pathways. So as I said, reimbursement was the key mechanism for in ensuring access to tools for people with diabetes. And so we've suggested here that there's a need to ensure that these are up to date 
and that they can recognize the full value of digital diabetes tools. So not just viewing them as digital versions of analog tools and processes, but recognizing the additional value that they bring, for example, in increased data collection, analysis, and manipulation. And as I said, because they are a major facilitator for the uptake into healthcare systems and delivery pathways, there's a need to ensure that these are working as they should. And similarly, assessment and evaluation purposes We've suggested that there's a need to ensure that these are fit for purpose because, again, these are often linked to reimbursement or they may be linked to ways in which um, tools are prescribed or different mandates. So it's really important that these tools are able to assess the digital diabetes tools at their fullest and understand the value and benefits that they bring. We also found in the research that clinical guidelines and diabetes plans often didn't include specific recommendations around digital tools. So all of the countries we looked at had diabetes plans, but only three mentioned digital diabetes tools. And these are really important because these help individual healthcare professionals to make evidence-based recommendations about the use of these different tools. There are so many tools out there that it's impossible for an individual healthcare professional to keep up with the evidence base behind all of them. So these tools are really crucial and it's important that clinical guidelines do reflect the reality of all of these different tools that are available and provide these evidence-based recommendations for individual clinicians. And then finally, the training as well is linked to the guidance in the sense of this is a key support mechanism for healthcare professionals. And we found that there was a huge variability both across countries and within countries in terms of how the training was taking place and its availability. And the reason that this is important and needs to be addressed is that training is a key mechanism for raising the awareness of healthcare professionals about the range of different tools that are available and also in improving their confidence in using these tools. And healthcare professionals play a really key role as advocates of these tools for their patients. So it's really important that they know what's out there and that they feel confident in using them. And the final future direction that we've identified is not specific to digital diabetes, but is really important. And it's around turning policy into action. So policy, is a crucial first step to achieving action, but it does not guarantee it. And there is no guarantee that policy will be implemented without funding, time, and political will. So we have suggested here that changes that happen to policy, new policy that is introduced, needs to be accompanied by, these, by funding, time, and political will to ensure that implementation will follow. The Digital Diabetes Index is available in a number of different formats, and today I've only been able to take you through a very quick introduction to it. So I'd encourage you to go to our digital hub at digitaldiabetesindex.eiu.com. Here you can find the index findings available in a digital format. You can download the Excel workbook and also the white paper and country profiles. The white paper itself presents the results of the index at a regional and country level and includes detailed country profiles for each of the 10 included countries. And I'd really encourage you to have a look at those because there's a lot of rich detail in those country profiles, not just about the index findings, but also broader context. And then finally, there's an Excel workbook that you can download which includes more information about, for example, indicator definitions, explanation of scoring decisions, and you can also explore the data for yourself through comparing different countries, looking at different correlations between indicators and domains. So that's our brief introduction to the Digital Diabetes Index, and I'll now hand over to my colleague Liz, who will take you through a panel discussion with three experts in diabetes. Great. Thank you for that, Ali. That's a really interesting. And um, so yeah, I'm Elizabeth Suka, Managing Editor and Global Healthcare Editorial Lead at the Economist Intelligence Unit. And we have a great panel today to discuss this topic. And if I say excellent timing, as the World Diabetes Day is only two days away, 
And the World Health Organization is going to be announcing its Global Diabetes Compact, which is going to support countries around prevention and management of this really um, this disease that impacts so many people, as um, Ali was talking about, and also the impacts from COVID as we're beginning to learn now of the evolving evidence. So today we're going to explore what role digital diabetes tools can play in helping people manage their condition and care, and also look at the enablers in healthcare system, systems for these tools. So the panelists we have today were um, on our advisory board for developing the index framework, and I would like to um, welcome them now. So first of all, we have Dr. Jeanette Soderberg. She's the Director of European Research at the JDRF International, which funds research, under, undertakes advocacy work to improve access to treatments and provide support to people living with type 1 diabetes. She is based in Stockholm. Um, then we have Dr. Henk Vizet. He's a senior international medical director and co-founder of the Diabetes Clinics in the Netherlands, which serves over 2,000 people, making it one of the largest type 1 diabetes clinics in Europe. Um, they focus on technology and uh, e-health solutions to deliver patient-centered care. And uh, Professor Nick Goudimont, he's the senior researcher at the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. He is board member of the Innovative Medical Device Initiative there as well, and also a member of the Commission on the National E-Health Implementation and Agenda in the Netherlands too. Welcome and thank you so much. Um, so, um, so we looked at quite a lot of variables in this um, Digital Diabetes Readiness Index in 10 countries. But um, perhaps one of the key elements is more a fundamental level of perception. So I'd really like to explore with you to start off with, um, how are these digital diabetes tools seen by three groups? So people living with diabetes, healthcare professionals and payers. So Jeanette, maybe you can start us off by talking about people living with the condition. Thank you. Sure, thanks Liz. So um, first of all, congratulations to the report. It's super, super interesting and we're very, very happy to be part of this. But for for the patient's community and people living with diabetes, I would say that the community is generally very positive to technologies. The digital diabetes for course, is such a wide concept. So it encompasses everything from apps to CGMs and pumps and telemedicine. But generally speaking, diabetes is particularly amenable to, to use of digital tools because of well, the self-management of the disease. So people with diabetes are very much used to constantly manage real-time data, figuring out what glucose levels they have, working out insulin doses. So technology is not something that they are unfamiliar with. And interestingly, we did a report with JDRF UK to understand people's views and needs of technology. And the desire for more information turned out to be a key priority for people with type 1. So, the, they report that they have limited opportunities to discuss technologies with their healthcare professionals, the time is too short, and they would very much like to have more information and have the opportunity to discuss this and also have a, a better understanding of the choices. And of course, there are many complex reasons to why people choose not to engage with technologies such as education and financial limitations and uh, physical attributes of the technology as, as well, but in general, there's a wish to learn more and engage. And we think that anyone who has the wish and wants to use technologies and would benefit from it should be allowed the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, and Nick, can I ask you to come up? But also, I'd like to also ask you, if, have you seen large scale outcome trials comparing say standard diabetes care compared to these new tools? I mean, is there an evidence gap around that area? So I'd like to hear about also the patient experience around these tools. So who do you want to go first? Yes. yes, thank you very much. And also my congratulations for this uh, report. Well, yes, uh, we see increasingly now some research coming up with, with some evidence on, on the use of tools and quite a positive uh, as well. I think in general, uh, so the, uh, the use of tool and digital in healthcare is still lagging behind uh, from other sectors. Uh, and uh, also this has to do with um, how uh, healthcare is organized and how healthcare itself is uh, digitalized and is accessible through sort of digital channels. Um, so it's largely fragmented. Uh, so especially if you're talking about more complex uh, conditions, 
and, and multiple conditions together. And especially in my background is more on the complex diabetes cases where you often deal with comorbidities, not only diabetes, uh, heart conditions, mental health, uh, often in, in, in very challenging populations with not so uh, literate. So I, I think especially in this area, we, we still have so much to do. So besides the sort of encouraging um, initiatives we see in, in research and in, in very small local initiatives, uh, the big thing is yet to happen. Okay, and uh, Henk, can, would you like to add any comments on, on, on that? Yeah, the, the, the digital space is uh, really improving. Um, that's the good thing of the bad thing of COVID. And um, also the health authorities and insurance com companies had made it more easy to make uh, screen to screen contact with patients equally reimbursable uh, as a face to face visit. So that has been implemented already, but it has been reinforced that uh, clinicians are allowed to do so. So that so incentives are equally for remote care as compared to face to face visits. The learning for patients is that they appreciate it very much. They, they start hesitating. Why should I come up to the clinic anyhow? <laughs> we are very satisfied with this kind of remote visits. Currently we send, let's say what we need on HbA1c samples. We send the material to the patient's home. They do the blood sampling and they send it back in an envelope to us. So that is also not a reason to show up. And we, can, we have so many data every day on their glucose matrices that we, it's so much that we separated that out to a cloud care team. They are watchful looking at the data with algorithms, uh, support of that. And then we can target, let's say, where there are deviations, where the regular nurse or the regular physician should have a look at. So we can very much pinpoint and aim to get with the remote care to an annual visit only and uh, be watchful when it progresses and be very targeted when we need to see the patients face to face at some time or we can stay remote and that is the big learnings of COVID and the patients appreciate it they 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 want to stay remote and it is especially the young patients so the, the new diagnosis where they they don't they can't imagine what regular care is. They, they step into technology immediately. Uh, so so Hank, that will change the total perspective of the healthcare delivery. I'm imagining, Hank, in, in the diabetes clinics that you um, manage in the Netherlands, uh, the healthcare professionals who work there are very much engaged in, in a lot mm -hmm. of it. So how would you describe other healthcare professionals? I mean, what are the kind of the, the, the limiting, um, kind of rate limiting steps here that we're seeing for, for the rest of the um, the health kind of professionals yeah. in your country, which you know they could possibly learn from your organization. Yeah. I see that many of my colleagues in other hospitals also change to e-health possibilities, but currently what they are lacking is let's say to deal with the enormous amount of data, to rank them accordingly. They don't have watch team to look at the uploads of um, 200 patients every day. We currently treat 3,000 patients, so it's very dense. So we are just building a kind of service which, where we can use it as a service for other hospitals to, to have their targeted patients um, where they should have a look at rather than touching in the dark and scheduling regular visit as a moment where you can get a recap of this all. So technology will replace a lot and I compare it with Euro control for the planes. Not every airport uh, guides the plane to the, to the far away airport. It's quickly handed over to, uh, to Euro control. Uh, they keep everyone happy in the flight path. And if everything is okay, you can continue flying. And you only make a landing if there is something needed. And then you get all, already notifications, what, what's wrong? What kind of spare material do you need to repair a problem? So um, I think it's, it's moving to that uh, direction, uh, but we see a huge gap between the understanding we create compared 
to people who are just, let's say, moving old care to screen to screen contact. <laughs> Um, they have you. not completely understood the magnitude of all this. That's great. Thank you, Hank. Um, so let's move a little bit to the payers now. So um, HTA tools are, are used a lot by payers to look at the value of medicines and devices. So how do you, maybe for you, Nick, first to start off with, how could these evolve over time, these evaluation systems, to better incorporate digital tools like, like these ones that Ali and her team looked at? I'm mute. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think still had the um, HTA approaches and also the related authorities for approval of of uh, technologies and, and interventions is uh, it's still quite traditional. So currently, if you look at trials, they're focusing on a traditional uh, type of measures um, and outcomes. Uh, had they look into very specific elements of the treatment. So doing this more comprehensive sort of evaluation on the total system, which includes service aspects, technology aspects, uh, and also all kinds of indicators related to that is, is still quite limited. And that's understandable because it's more complex. It takes more time and, it, and it's more costly. And also in a an, in an situation where we have increasingly less resources, um, and also the, the sort of sponsors are more, let's say, um, yeah, very keen on, on budgets and money uh, and also on, on time for evaluation. And so you see also in, in this area of creating evidence, uh, we are lacking behind. Um, I think the, the, the promise for the future is that we can collect maybe more data uh, through what they call real world evidence uh, had to, to, uh, to prove uh, a sort of benefit or value from a broader perspective. I, I think this, these are still uh, promises and uh, sort of ideas. Um, so the implication on how to manage and organize this is quite complex and, and needs also um, a national sort of na nationwide approach. It doesn't only apply to diabetes, but oncology, cardiovascular diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe even at the European approach. Um, and also there, how you see that the European Commission is, is doing really good work. It's, it's are the member states and also the related organization at the national level who really are the problem to, to keeping up pace with this sort of ideas. Thank you, Nick. And uh, Jeanette, do you agree with that? And also I'd like to ask you, I mean, a lot of the research in, in this index, we looked at incentives and payments. Um, how do you think incentive structures can be changed within healthcare systems to make better use of these tools? Oh, so that's a very interesting question. I, I guess I'm going to start with that and then come back to Nick's point, which I do agree with. Mm -hmm. I think that reimbursement is a huge barrier for people with diabetes to use technologies. Uh, it can, of course, be the fact that people can't afford that having a technology at all, but it can also be very simple things like my insurance only covers one type of device and I would like to have another one, or my device fails early, but my insurance won't pay me a new one until next year. But there are all these little things that are details that should be able to work out pretty easily to, to improve people's access to care. The second part is also from a socioeconomic perspective is that there, there, is, um, there is a lack of information flowing to people who have uh, lower levels of education or socioeconomic lower levels where they aren't actually aware of all the different types of technologies available to them and they don't use them as much. And then even though they might have an endo who's very, very uh, engaged and enthusiastic and tells them about them, then the reimbursement problem becomes, again, something that is prohibitive and they can't afford the technology. So, so there's a lot of things that need to be worked out in that type. Um, I wanted to come back to one of the points that Nick made regarding the, the evidence, uh, the generation of evidence that is absolutely needed. One of the things um, for about telemedicine is that we don't actually have very good evidence on the benefits of it, neither from an uh, health economic perspective, as Nick was talking about, but also from 
uh, a physiological perspective for people with diabetes. For instance, there's a there's a a concern that we might be missing on mental health issues if we only do remote visits. There are different aspects to that that we need to take into consideration to find a solution which is acceptable from a health economic perspective, but also suitable for the people with diabetes and fits their needs. So multiple aspects, but in general, I do agree with Nick. It's a, something we need to consider and something we need to work on. That's marvelous. Thank you, Jeanette. And um, I'd like to shift the conversation slightly and I've seen some questions coming through here and please panelists, if you want to respond in the chat to some of those very specific questions, please do. Um, so clinical guidelines are really important enabling documents um, for healthcare professionals, but they're not always followed or updated regularly. And our research showed only four out of 10 European of these European countries we looked at um, included recommendations on implementing digital diabetes tools in practice. So can you talk us through, um, maybe we'll start with you, Hank, can you talk us through what is inhibiting change around guidelines? Yeah, it's um, in general, hospitals are frameworks which by nature are a bit conservative towards change. Uh, if you want to move to remote care, you need to have other kinds of rooms and facilities scheduled around other times. Perhaps you need some change in the staff, uh, your team composition of nurse, doctor, dietitian, receptionist, all have different directors and all needs to be aligned to make that change possible. Uh, you have this um, hospital opinions about um, firewalls and re use of remote programs elsewhere in the space than the hospital itself. Um, so connecting devices to third parties and getting the data in your system raises a lot of uh, problems. So kind of technical problems um, and, and that makes life difficult for the, the physicians inside. And also, do they want to change their, their habits and the way they work and they schedule to get to make both ends meet to work in the hospital? So there is a lot of change is always difficult. And, um, uh, and here we are helped by, let's say that we are our own clinic taking care for 3000 patients are growing and expanding abroad that the focus is really helping you. So I, I am a very strong believer that if you want change, you need to have a focus and a few clinics leading the way and sharing, let's say, be able to share the learnings and apply it elsewhere. Um, that, that could be a way to do it. And the leading clinics could also collect data. If you move faster, the faster you move, the less availability you have of proof of, uh, let's say, uh, published proof of the concepts. But you should let the, the front runners go with a kind of trust and let them provide the proof what works and what doesn't work. And then the others could take up more early. Um, but it needs data, it needs uh, money, it needs the power to, to, do, uh, to create publications, etc. And the, I think the other players here in the network and, and Jeanette, they, they are of major importance to that we all need to work together to get a faster uh, implementation. Thank you, Hank, for that. I'd like to ask Nick. Um, so Nick, what are your thoughts around what's inhibiting um, change around clinical guidelines? Is it resources mostly? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And Jeanette, if you could come in too. Well, I, I think the, um, it's quite complex. Uh, so first of all, mostly it's it's like the evidence uh, generated, um, and has so and because the evidence is leading, and related research is mostly focused on on particular groups, uh, have particular interventions in a specific context. You see in this more broader perspective on how you deal with more complex cases, multi morbidities. Um, you see also had a discussion uh, uh, along with clinical protocols and, and guidelines. It's, it's also still quite um, uh, focusing on single issues and not this more holistic perspective. And the use of different clinical protocols in practice is still a challenge. Um, 
So I think, and this also applies to diabetes. Uh, so uh, also, uh, it's without doubt, it's uh, there are a lot of interest also in the establishment of these clinical protocols. It's also a layer to take in consideration. So if professional groups see a sort of uh, threat for their um, uh, financing model or et cetera, it, it might also create a complication. Um, so I think the clinical protocols is a, also a reflection on other uh, challenges you see in the, in the healthcare um, uh, sector uh, with and, and not only evidence and uh, et cetera, but also technology limitation, methodological uh, uh, limitation, the way to uh, the, the ability to translate clinical protocols to practice uh, in, in a more multidisciplinary and holistic way. Um, so, but yeah, so that, that's something to, to, to take in consideration and also with a professional group to, to discuss and how we can improve on this. Fantastic. <laughs> Janet, do you have anything to add? Well, I do agree with, with both Hank and Nick, and it is a complex situation in terms of how to get these guidelines into clinical practice. And I, I think there is a couple of things that are needed. First is a strong voice of the patients explaining how this is critically important to the community. Then comes Nick's point about health economics, that it is very important that we have the data that it shows that this is beneficial for both the society as well as the individual. And then you have Hank's point of how to engage the centers. How do we build a healthcare system that is concentrated on data, that has um, a clear focus on the patient value, such as what Diabeter has been doing, which is absolutely amazing, gathering all types of cares in one center to enable the patients to, to see people uh, at a very, it's very easy for them. And I think that all of this need to work together, otherwise we're not gonna get anywhere. Um, but I would, if I could start with the healthcare professionals because um, as allies to the patients and to people with diabetes, um, they are a motor and a driving force that we, we need to work together with. And I think they can be the, the source of change for the whole healthcare system. So I'm really glad you raised the healthcare professionals. So. Um, our research also showed that, you know, um, digital diabetes training for healthcare professionals is not yet comprehensive. So maybe we'll start with you, Hank. Um, can you talk us through some best practices and where can we make quick wins in this area? I mean, what are the key competencies and skills these healthcare professionals will need going forward? Thanks. I, I think that that focus is of imminent importance. If you compare, let's say, your general knowledge um, with the pilot, if he has been on a holiday for two weeks, he needs to go to training before flying. He doesn't fly on all the planes. So he has experience with one item. And uh, so many physicians who deal with diabetes um, in the midst of all so many other problems, that focus is really difficult. There are not so many focused physicians there. Uh, there are, but there are not so many. Most patients are treated by non-focused physicians. And if you're non-focused, you have less experience. It's di more difficult to keep up with all the changes in technology. You might likely have a dedicated EMR, which is, has the heat map on your blood sugar profiles and all the, the, the metrics, et cetera, et cetera, available. So in my advice, focus is a key element. And why is it so difficult? Um, a minority of physicians treat the majority of patients with type 1 diabetes. But the minority of those physicians are a minor stakeholder in their professional organizations, and they de decide with a majority. So it, it's, it's, it's a difficult balance to, to provoke changes because there is so much at stake in the different priorities. And I, I'm a very much in favor that the, the focus clinics can lead the way. It's either a big university hospital or it is a diabetes-like structure. There are a lot of examples around the world uh, where there is focus and they, they lead the way. If you look for the SWEET program where they collect data and, and they compare and they challenge each other, 
I think those platforms across Europe, and now it's more now acting worldwide, they are excellent. And if that is smartly linked up with the power of JDRF, we get somewhere. And with Nick, with his link to, to the EU, we get somewhere. And, um, and that is of major importance. We should look at the European scale more than at a national level. And, um, Nick, do you want to add anything on um, about the training for healthcare professionals? What's some best practices that you've seen or think there should be in this area? Yes, I think it's an important element for many other uh, disciplines uh, uh, dealing with diabetes. And uh, in some countries, these sort of networks are strongly established with, with learning, etc. And I think there's also quite a willingness to learn from each other and, and uh, to do the best for patients. Um, however, I, I think this can be uh, improved um, uh, on, on different levels, on regional level, national level, European level, even internationally. Um, so I think we should uh, make benefit of this willingness and also the professionality often of, of the people. Um, I, I think also um, what could require more attention is the training of um, informal carers and family and friends in this respect, because yeah, often the elements which are responsible or related to development of complication is really um, a social context issue. You are influenced by your environment at home, at school, at work, etc. And so also this taking into account how can we train relatives and people important for patients in order to better manage their health, having a good diet, doing exercises or doing regular checks and etc. adherence to therapy. And so also this, this sort of system context issues and how do you engage those people and how do you train accordingly um, at the professionals in, in making this happen. And, and it doesn't not always necessarily have to be the uh, diabetologist who's doing this, but the diabetic nurses are, are, are well trained often to, to do this. Um, yes. So also here, I think yeah, yeah. that could extend uh, these, these elements to other areas. Thank you for that. Nick. I know we're short on time now, and um, I probably just can I just jump in. Sorry. Slightly. Oh, yeah, sorry, Janet, quickly, and then we uh, Super quickly. No, I just agree completely with Hank that uh, concentrated care with people who are extremely used to seeing people with diabetes is extremely necessary. But then to, to Nick's point, I just wanted to say that about two thirds of people with diabetes report that the nurses are the people who tell them about technology and the awareness of technology comes from the nurses. And well, next year is the, the diabetes year of the diabetes nurse. We should definitely engage with them yes. and support the community around the patient, family members, friends, employees, employers, anyone who's around the person needs to be aware and feel supported. But I'm, I'm happy that we have the same view on that. All three of That's them. great to hear. Yes, I saw a lot of um, alliances there. Um, I'd like to move the conversation to look at um, the tools themselves, these digital tools and the inclusiveness of them. And also to what extent when these are tools are developed, they integrate the views of users so that they're user friendly, accessible and protect their data. So it's a big area. So um, maybe we'll start with you, um, Jeanette, and then we'll go to Hank. Well, so I think that most people who develop tools are trying their very best to incorporate views of the end users, the, the people with diabetes. I also think that now, for instance, with COVID, we've had an explosion of digital tools available to us. And it is, as Hank was discussing before, that the need for speed versus uh, the clinical evidence and engaging patients in the development uh, process might lack because of this current situation that we have. So this is a bit special in how we develop it. However, I think that what we do need is a, a concerted effort on understanding how these technologies, these apps and different things work and which ones are clinical relevant, which ones has a, have an effect and to which population they're targeting. And it, it would be nice to know that the NHS has a tool that uh, gathers every different type of technology. So in one place where people with diabetes can find them and make an informed decision in which one to use and, and seek information. And, 
that type of platform where we have information about all technologies that is very, very valuable for people looking for information. So I would encourage others to do something similar. Um, uh, please come in. Um, yeah. Nick. yeah, it's very important to be able to share and to see the data. And if you want to, let's say, process the data, you want to have access to data and it's the patient's data. And there are, uh, there is one big industry around who captures all the data and doesn't just refuses to forward the data to the clinic to deal with it. And, and that should not be allowed. And um, we have to fight that. So we must have access, be able to, to get the patient's data, of course, if they approve. approve. Uh, and there should be no one in between holding that up. So th that is the first need for the using and applying technologies. Currently, the technologies, I see that on different fields coming from different industries, they come more of easy use. So currently now in COVID, we give video instructions. They get the devices at home and they start using the device with our video conference guidance. So it's it's really getting more easy, more simple. The education becomes less of a burden. Um, the remaining point is what you stick in your skin. Uh, it's, it's the measuring devices, how long can they stay in, and especially the insulin tubing devices uh, to replace them every two to three days. Um, that is the hard part of it. Um, which needs to be resolved, that it can stay in longer, it gives uh, less, uh, be a, a hurdle to use them and to replace it wisely. Um, that is the remaining part. I think the current state of technology is getting so close. If we look for the latest devices we are using, uh, patients get to biological normal. Uh, they get time in range of uh, between 95 to 100% easily. Uh, they don't have to interfere so much. The pump takes over. You can not be accurate on your carb counting. The pump recognizes and uh, deals with it uh, to get to normal. And, and we haven't seen that before. So we now get to a target where you say, this is a life with diabetes. Yeah, we cannot take that away yet, although there is work done on that as well. Uh, but at least you don't aim for complications and you have a normal life expectancy. That is what we currently see happening. Yes, and that's what we need, that normal life expectancy. We've only got a few minutes left, Nick. Maybe I'll just let you give us some final comments then and on this. And also, um, Ali talked about, um, you know, our report looked at policy environment, but, you know, it's all about implementation. So what do you think are the key steps we can take to ensure policy translate into action? And then we're going to have to close this fantastic session, I'm afraid. Over to you, mm -hmm. Nick. Well, the, uh, so to, to make one point to the previous uh, question, uh, so also at the professional side, it's important that things are uh, very user-friendly and, and quite easy to, to manage. And uh, also there we see a lot of applications uh, standing alone uh, due to lack of interoperability and integration uh, challenges. And, and professionals in general are increasingly fed up with putting data in systems uh, which don't work. So you see their growing reluctance on and to, to buy in these sort of developments. So we have to take that in consideration as well. Um, I think the, the whole challenge with uh, digital supported integrated diabetes management is facing similar system uh, barriers and challenges with implementation as other disease areas uh, where you can do the same in oncology, cardiovascular, mental. Um, and so usually uh, it's the implication is that you have to redesign uh, services activities along the pathway of the patients. And therefore you, have, you need the different stakeholders to multiple disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's, the first challenge, which is more operational thing. Uh, I think the good thing is that we have increasingly lessons which can help us. Um, the technology part is the thing which should support this. And here you have the technical issues such as interoperability, etc. 
has so the the sort of data and data sharing in this respect i think is is highly dominated by the legal discussion on one hand or the technical discussion encryption blockchain etc while we should also as professionals as um, policy makers should focus more on the functional aspect what do we need in order to make it work rather than than putting the legal and the technical things first so uh -huh. i think also that in re professionals might stand up stand up a little bit and more okay this is what we need as as professionals in order to make it work uh, and the same from a patient perspective that's amazing nick and I'm afraid we've come to the end of this great discussion. I've learned so much. I had so many questions. I also had a question. I was very curious as to how these tools are going to evolve over time, but for another discussion. But thank you so much, Jeanette, Nick and Hank. Amazing insight there. And also thank you to our um, audience for watching this and sending your fantastic questions. And thank you to panelists for answering some of those questions. I'm now going to pass over to our sponsor for today's event. Um, thank you so much, Tanya from MedTech Europe. Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Tanja Valentin. I'm external affairs director at MedTech Europe. And I speak here on behalf of the European diabetes sector group we have at MedTech Europe, which brings together nine leading diabetes medical technology companies, which aim to champion the needs of people living with diabetes and their health professionals around them and who commission the studies. So on behalf of that group, I'd like to congratulate EIU for this important research and thank the panel for, for this discussion with a lot of insights. And I would like also to thank the experts for their guidance throughout the research and during the index creation process in particular. And their guidance made the index very tangible and relevant for debates um, of diabetes care in Europe today. So we started actually this pro, uh, project already in 2019 and it was many months in the making um, and it was conceived as a way to explore the core question, why digital solutions, which are already been developed and are widely supported by the diabetes community, experience still a very various degree of uptake by health systems across Europe. Um, as a matter of fact, digital technologies already are here today. So any type of glucose monitoring system or insulin delivery system has embraced and incorporated digital elements from remote monitoring, we heard over data management, data analysis, AI applications, other apps and so forth. So the question we wanted to raise with the study is how much the healthcare systems are ready to use them and what are the key enablers to facilitate the use of digital diabetes tools. And the question became even more relevant in light of the COVID pandemic, which affects us all heavily. And this pandemic brought a whole new momentum in the need and also in the acceptance for digital, digital enabled care, what we heard from the panel as well. So from our end, the key findings of the study were quite eye-opening, being that a lot of literature and discussions look at the level of broader policies, such as having national diabetes plans in place or the existence of national electronic health records, which are all important. However, our expert panel advised very early on in the project that the core question is more about how health systems pursue the way from policies to meaningful implementation. So therefore, the, the whole project focus on identifying and scoring and weighing key indicators that play a role in paving the way from policy to implementation. And I wanted to point out three key results that we found most striking reading the, the final report. One is that national policies, policies need updating and explicitly need a reference to digital tools and services, which many of them not have yet. Then secondly, that policy implementation happens far from policy implementation. There's often regional and uh, local responsibilities on implementing what is needed for good diabetes care. And that has tangible impact. To have the right incentive structures in place is the third key finding we take away, as we heard by the panel, and becomes key for the use 
of, of digital enabled tools and services. So we, we haven't talked a lot today about the individual country profiles, but they show a lot of promising new and best practice in how to move forward on these three key points, which I mentioned. So we see this research now as an important step on a journey towards tangible positive change for, for diabetes care. And we aim to sharing the results now with the different communities at European level, national levels to reflect and then hopefully act on the findings. So in this spirit, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion this morning. Um, please reach out to EIU and us uh, in the MedTech Europe Diabetes Group as we are very much interested in receiving your feedback on the debate now and also ideas on how to move forward from here. So I, I'd like to thank you very much for your precious time and attention today. And I hope I speak to many of you soon. Thanks and back to you. Thank you, Tanya. And it's really interesting to hear the take of MedTech Europe on, on the research there and, and also your response to the, the panelists discussion. So just in terms of the next steps for the, for the research, we have um, the digital diabetes index.eiu.com digital hub, which we'd really encourage you to visit. As Tanya said, there's loads of information on there about the country profiles. There's lots of detailed information about the findings in the white paper, etc., which we just couldn't cover due to time today and also on Saturday as well Diabetes Day so there'll be loads of activity on social media etc so please do join in with that conversation and I've included here our Twitter, LinkedIn and, and Facebook handles for both the EIU and MedTech Europe both of whom will be posting about the Digital Diabetes Index around the next few weeks and also the COVID context came up quite a lot in the discussion today, and I'd encourage you to have a look at the white paper because we do have an entire section where we talk to various individuals with diabetes and healthcare professionals about the impact that COVID had had on services. So that's a really interesting read, which I'd encourage you to have a look at. So by way of wrapping up today, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. It's been a really interesting event and I hope that you found it informative and useful. Thank you again to the panelists for taking part in today's discussion. I think that really helped to embellish the findings of the research for me and also to help to put it into that practical context. And thank you, Liz, for your wonderful moderation of that event. So thank you everyone for attending today and goodbye.